What's up, wild ones? Welcome to episode number 214 of the Untame the Wild Soul podcast. I'm your host, Elizabeth Dialto, and this is Sunday Sermon number 17. If you're new to the podcast or this is your first Sunday Sermon, these are shorter solo episodes, 10 to 20 minutes, where I do things like oracle readings, share my favorite prayers, poems, and excerpts from what I'm reading. They're like wild and untamed gospel, heart ponderings, and delicious morsels of wisdom to spark your own truth, power, and love from my wild soul to yours. In these episodes, I'll explore creative and inspiring ideas, thoughts, and ruminations for you to be nourished and fed by going into your week. As a person who was raised with religion, another inspiration to create these sermons was to provide a Sunday ritual that's more aligned with my current and ever-evolving spirituality and worldviews. That said, all belief systems are welcomed here on the show. My truth, ponderings, and curiosities are simply that my own. So no matter what your faith is, may you get exactly what you need from listening to this and may you remember always that everything you've ever needed has always been inside of you. You are made from love, you are love, and you are loved. Today's sermon is inspired by Brene Brown's most recent book, Braving the Wilderness. And this is actually part two because I covered part one last week. There's a whole chapter called Speak Truth to Bullshit, Be Civil. And last week we got into the Speak Truth to Bullshit part. If you haven't listened to that episode, I do recommend pausing this one and listening to that first. It's episode number 212 and you can find it at untameyourself.com forward slash episode dash 212 or in whatever player you listen to podcasts on. If you're all caught up and ready to dive into being civil, like last week, I'm going to read a good bit from the book, chime in with my own reflections and experiences, and you'll be able to tell I'm really geeking out on this. Courageous communication is one of my favorite topics, and I've seen so much healing and transformation happen in my life when people learn how to speak to each other, say what they mean, be brave about it, and not cause harm with their words. So let's start with her first passage in the chapter on civility. Here's what she wrote. It's easier to stay civil when we're combating lying than it is when we're speaking truth to bullshit. When we're bullshitting, we aren't interested in the truth as a shared starting point. This makes arguing slippery, and it makes us more susceptible to mirroring the BS behavior, which is, the truth doesn't matter, what I think matters. It's helpful to keep in mind Alberto Brandolini's bullshit asymmetry principle, or what's sometimes known as Brandolino's law. The amount of energy needed to refute bullshit is an order of magnitude bigger than to produce it. Sometimes calling out BS is unnecessary because there's an expectation of embellishment, like an overly polite compliment, or in the case of my Texan family, a tall tale of walking uphill to school both ways in the snow, pulling a donkey. But when the stakes are high and we need to speak truth to bullshit, I've seen two practices that increase effectiveness. First, approach bullshitting with generosity when possible. Don't assume that people know better and they're just being malicious or mean-spirited. In highly charged discussions, we can feel shame about not having an informed opinion, and these feelings of not enough can lead us to bullshitting our way through a conversation. We can also believe we're responding from real data and have no idea that there's nothing to back up what we're saying. Additionally, we can get so caught up in our own pain and fear that truth and fact play second fiddle to emotional pleas for understanding or agreement. Generosity, empathy, and curiosity e.g., where did you read this or hear this, can go a long way in our efforts to question what we're hearing and introduce fact. The second practice is civility. I found a definition of civility from the Institute for Civility in Government that very closely reflects how the research participants talked about it. The organization's co-founders, Cassandra Donkey and Thomas Spath, wrote, Civility is claiming and caring for one's identity, needs, and beliefs, without degrading someone else's in the process. Civility is about disagreeing without disrespect, seeking common ground as a starting point for dialogue about differences, listening past one's preconceptions, and teaching others to do the same. Civility is hard work of staying present even with those with whom we have deep-rooted and fierce disagreements. It's political in the sense that it's a necessary prerequisite for civic action. But it's political, too, in the sense that it's about negotiating interpersonal power such that everyone's voice is heard and nobody's is ignored. I love that. Everyone's voice is heard and nobody's is ignored. I feel like that's super important, as well as being able to connect in a way that isn't causing harm with your words. 
as a human race, we cause a lot of harm with our words. And the next passage I want to read to you, Brene reflects on interviewing NFL coach Pete Carroll of the Seattle Seahawks for her research. She wrote, when I asked him about the challenges of developing an organizational culture of true belonging, he offered what I believe is a profound insight into brave leadership. There's no question that it's easier to manage a fitting in culture. You set standards and rules, you lead by put up or shut up, but you miss real opportunities, especially helping your team members find their purpose. When you push a fitting in culture, you miss the opportunity to help people find their personal drive, what's coming from their hearts. Leading for true belonging is about creating a culture that celebrates uniqueness. What serves leaders best is understanding your players' best efforts. My job as a leader is to identify their unique gift or contribution. A strong leader pulls players towards a deep belief in themselves. I especially love this passage because we build this culture inside all of my spaces at Wild Soul Movement. I even encourage people to disagree with me, and an amazing thing happens when they do. Often they speak up, kind of scared, and sometimes in an apologetic way. Almost always expecting me to combat them, but I don't. I appreciate the feedback and respect their stance. We listen to each other and often learn things on both sides. It's so healing to be met with peaceful agreement, with peaceful disagreement, curiosity, and openness when the need to be right isn't a priority. And this is cool because if you did the Unconsume Yourself Challenge with me recently, I talked about the need to be right on day one. Brene goes on to mention it too in the next passage. Here's what she wrote. Words as weapons. Sometimes civility takes the shape of respect and generosity. I recently taught an online class with Dr. Harriet Lerner on how to offer a true heartfelt apology and how to accept one. It kicked my ass. I think we should broadcast these apologizing lessons over the airways of some Orwellian TV station so everyone in the country could learn these skills. We need them. As Harriet invited me to practice listening and apologizing without disclaimers and exceptions, I learned that when I'm armored up, I'd rather be right than connected and invested in my relationship. I want to win. I love being right. The need to be right is magnified when we feel we're in hostile territory and under attack. A cultural example of this is political correctness. The history of this concept is as wild and unruly as the conversations about it have become. At this point, the term is so loaded that I think it makes more sense to talk about inclusive language. Given what we know about dehumanizing, I believe inclusive language is critically important, absolutely worth the effort, and a function of civility. We often take sides when it comes to the big political debates around issues like sports team names and ignore the everyday instances that are equally diminishing. For example, let's say you've been diagnosed with anxiety and your child has attention deficit disorder. How would you feel if you overheard your doctor saying, yeah, I've got my anxiety disorder coming in at two, then I'm going to see the ADD kid before I go home? Proponents of inclusive language would say that you're not your diagnosis. You're a person with anxiety. It matters to all of us. No one wants to be reduced. But what's tough about the inclusive language movement is when people turn using the right language into a weapon to shame or belittle people. This came up over and over in the research. Even tools of civility can become weaponized if the intention is there. I'll share a couple of stories with you. First, there was a man in his late 20s who shared a story of driving from his home in Los Angeles to Newport Beach to visit his parents. He told me that during the morning drive, he made a commitment to being more patient with and tolerant of his father. They had a long history of not getting along. The afternoon the man arrived, he was standing in the kitchen making small talk when he asked his father, how are your new neighbors? His father said, we really like them. We've had them over for dinner a couple times and we've become friends. They're cooking us dinner next week. They're oriental and she's going to make her special dumplings, so your mom is really looking forward to it. The young man told me that he ripped right into his father. Oriental? Jesus, Dad, are you kidding? Racist much? Before his father could even respond, he went back at him. Oriental is so racist. Do you even know where they're from? There's no country called the Orient. How embarrassing. He said that rather than engaging, his father stood in the kitchen with his head down. When he finally looked up at his son, he was teary-eyed. I'm sorry, son. I'm not sure what I've done or not done to make you so angry. I just can't do anything right. Nothing I do or say is good enough for you. There was total silence. Then his father said, I'd stay and let you tell me what an asshole I am, but I'm taking the neighbor I supposedly hate to pick up her husband from cataract surgery. She doesn't drive, and he took a cab this morning. 
During the interview, the man told me that he didn't know what to do or say, so he just walked away before his dad left the kitchen. When I first heard that story, because I listened to the book on Audible before I got it in print, I told you I geek out on Brene, I needed both, I remembered times when I'd done that to people earlier on in my own journey, when I needed to be right or thought I knew better. This is my favorite part about Brene's approach to being civil. Assuming generosity, leading with curiosity, and asking questions before we make assumptions. This is so helpful in so many contexts. So let me repeat those things. What if we assume generosity? Meaning, as Brene explained, assume that maybe people aren't being dicks on purpose or bullshitting on purpose. Maybe they truly think they know what they're talking about. And through some gentle and curious questions, we can introduce fact into the conversation instead of being defensive or combative. And what if we lead with curiosity about where people are coming from and ask questions before making assumptions? As someone who practices this, I can tell you what's available. It's greater intimacy, a ton of learning, and much more solid relationships. So that wraps up my musings on Braving the Wilderness, Brene Brown's new book. I hope you'll check out the rest of it for context and find me online to let me know what you thought of these episodes. As you know, I appreciate your time so much. It's a creative blessing to me to be able to riff on whatever I feel like and know that other people find it useful too. So have a beautiful week. Show notes for this episode are at untameyourself.com forward slash episode dash 214. And a quick reminder, if you're listening to this in real time, enrollment closes for the Unconsume Yourself live training program tomorrow, December 4th, and we start the training this Wednesday, December 6th. If you haven't checked it out yet and want some heads up on whether or not it would be worth your time, here's who the training is really designed for. You want to stop thinking or believing that you're not enough or there isn't enough time, money, energy, opportunity, good men, good women, or et cetera to go around. You want to let go of toxic feelings like guilt, shame, anger, blame, fear, stress, and anxiety and reclaim your power and inner authority. You want to break any limiting or self-sabotaging patterns and habits and let go of unhealthy relationships. You want to make contentment and fulfillment your new normal and experience more grace, ease, and flow in your day-to-day life. You want to stop judging yourself and others, people-pleasing and seeking so much for external approval. You want to be resourced from within with full trust, love, acceptance, and respect for yourself. You want to feel safe at home and confident in your body with your thoughts, feelings, personal power, and spiritual connection. And you're tired of trying to figure all this out on your own. You crave a community to support you and would appreciate the accountability of an experienced guide who's achieved many of the results you seek. It's not really for you if you're set in your belief that life has to be hard, if you don't think change, healing, or transformation are possible, if you can't be kind, compassionate, or respectful towards others' experiences and opinions, if you're super self-righteous or prefer focusing on problems and blaming others for your circumstances rather than working towards solutions and taking responsibility for yourself, If you'd rather stay small in your life and feel unfulfilled than rock the boat, if you don't want relationships that are deeper and more meaningful, if you don't want to put in the work or are looking for an easy fix, or if your life is exactly how you want it to be right now and you rarely feel stressed, overwhelmed, or dissatisfied, those would be reasons why the course isn't for you and not to check it out. So if you resonated with any of the reasons why the training would be for you, check it out over at wildsoulmovement.com forward slash U-C-Y as in unconsume yourself live. So wildsoulmovement.com forward slash UCY live. And this is a great time of year to be diving into work like this so you can create the kind of momentum you actually want in your life going into 2018. So if you check it out and choose to join us, I cannot wait to work with you more closely. And other than that, I'll be back next week.